So if we go to the lab and we do those tests that we talked about earlier. So in the lab, we can control, and if we do a triaxial test, we can control S3, control S1, which is the only two principal stresses. So if we're doing a triaxial test, S2 and S3 are equal to one another. Those are the hydrostatic confining pressures. S1 is the mechanically loaded pressure from the top, right? So in that case, we can go and we can do a series of tests in the lab controlling the principal stress difference, and we can build a series of these more failure envelopes, okay? When we, when we do that, so when we build up this series of envelopes, if we connect them with a line, this line, we create a failure envelope, okay? So if the state of stress is outside this line, above this line in any way, then we, we create a failure envelope. And this, the point where these circles are tangent to that line, this angle for every circle is the two beta. So whenever sigma 3 equals to 0, or I'm sorry, whenever, you know, the, the S3 equals to 0, then that's the case, that's the unconfined compressive stress test, right? Because there you have no triaxial confinement, you're just applying one stress, and so you'd get this first Mohr circle here. Okay, so you'll see this in the Zobax book. A lot of times you guys ask me where we're at in the book. Uh, we're in chapter four now, and I label these figures when I use them from the book so that you can go and, you know, if you read the pages around that figure, that's where we are in the book. Anyway, so in Zobac, you'll see this unconfined compressive strength uh, labeled as C0. Okay. So if we take a so this is the real Mohr envelope. If we go to the lab, we do a series of these tests, right? Now if we take a sort of linearized approximation. So the real envelope is, you know, basically drawing a line that connects the tangent points of those curves, right? But the real envelope is a parabola or something more complicated, and we like simple models as engineers, so the, the simplest one we could come up with uh, would be, if we linearized it, we just took the best fit straight line through the tangent points of, uh, points of those curves, okay? And if we do that, then we have the linearized Mohr envelope, okay? And we introduce this thing called cohesion. So we have, well, actually, we introduce here two new terms. So S0 is the y-intercept of this line. So it's the, it's the slope of the line where it crosses uh, the y-axis. I'm sorry, it's, it's the y-intercept. The slope of the line, mu, is called the coefficient of internal friction, okay? So this cohesion comes, the word cohesion comes from soil mechanics. This model is used a lot to model loosely, co you know, lightly uh, uh, cemented sands, loosely cemented sands, unconsolidated sands. And so we have a line now, and we can then write a very simple model from that line. Now, in order, you know, the, the, the model is just, it's the equation of the line, right? So it's tau is the y-intercept plus the slope 
times the normal stress, right? But the cohesion is not something we can directly measure. We can infer it through a series of these triaxial tests, or if we have an unconfined compressive strength, we can infer it just based on the geometry, right? So there's a relationship based on the geometry and the internal co co uh, friction angle between the unconfined compressive strength and the cohesion. So there's the equation again. There's a relationship between the unconfined compressive strength and the cohesion. And so here's how you might actually go about doing it. Uh, you go to the lab, you do some triaxial tests. These are actual tests car carried out on sandstone. So you're controlling S1 and S3. And when the sample fails, you put a dot on the S1 and S3 axis, right? And you vary S1 and S3, and you put a dot. You vary S1 and S3, and you put a dot. And then you plot those lines, and the slope of that line is in, right? Now, this is on the S1, S3 axis, but it's just they're all related through the geometry of the Mohr circle so that you can then infer or determine what the... Um, what the internal friction angle is, mu, from the slope of this. And the cohesion is the, again, the y-intercept. So, you know, here is, again, actual data on sandstone, um, a more envelope. So these are the more cir circles at multiple uh, principal stress difference, uh, you know, values. And you can see that the real Mohr envelope, you know, the real line that touches the tangents to all those curves is here, and the linearized is here. So in this case, uh, you know, especially at high principal stress values, it's probably not a good approximation. You might want to use a different model, right? But at low principal stress differences, probably not such a bad model. And so here's some actual data for the cohesion and internal friction for a variety of sands. Uh, you can see that, I mean, I'm sorry, not just sands, a variety of rocks um, and, you know, s some so-called even, you know, weak rocks which have very low cohesive strength can still have a pretty high coefficient of internal friction. So this means that, you know, this is the slope of that line. So at high principal stress differences out away, you know, higher up the normal stress value, high principal stress differences, then you can actually have, you know, still a lot of strength in these materials, even though the cohesive strength is quite low. And so let's look at an example of sort of how we, how we can use this or how it uh, implies or, or works for us in terms of drilling. And of course, 100 years ago, drillers figured this out without more circles. They just figured it out through intuition. Uh, but they can use the, the mud weight to add wellbore stability. Okay, so if you look at, you know, if you go back to, if you recall from our stresses in the wellbore, uh, the principles, the primary principal stress, S3, uh, sigma 3, in the wellbore is sigma RR, which was equal to delta P, where delta P is the difference in the pressure in the wellbore and the pore pressure, right? And so, obviously, if you have a strong rock, there's this is the more failure surface for a strong rock, and it doesn't matter. It's it's well above for either case. But if you have a a, a weak rock, 
and you have a balanced mud weight so that the mud weight is equal to the pore pressure. If the mud weight is equal to the pore pressure, this guy is going to be zero, right? So sigma RR is zero, okay? Now, the primary uh, principal stress one, the, the highest principal stress in the well bore is typically the hoop stress. So sigma theta theta. Sigma theta, that's theta theta, right? So the maximum principal stress in the well bore is the hoop stress. This is the circumferential stress around the well bore wall, okay? And so, you know, it, it's going to be out here somewhere. And if we increase the delta P, so in, in other words, if we increase the mud weight, moving the delta P away from zero, then we shrink that more circle and we move it off the failure line. So this, this would be, this scenario of a balanced mud weight here would fail, would be an unstable well bore because the more circle touches this line, right? Crosses it, in fact. But if we increase the mud weight, we shrink that more circle, moving it off that line and increasing well bore stability. So just to give you an idea, if we look at this more coulomb criteria in the principal stress space, uh, including all three principal stresses, then you get this kind of conic thing where the angle of this cone, the slope, you know, the, the, the see if I can draw this, kind of the, this angle is the, uh, it's related to the internal friction angle. And if we look right down, the, it's called the pi plane. So this is the plane where sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. If we look right down it, then you get this hexahedron type shape thing. So basically what we're, what we're saying here is in, in fully three dimensions, considering the, all three principal stresses, the state of stress has to be, in terms of the principal stresses, has to be inside that conical thing or the rock will fail. If the principal stresses are arranged such that it takes you outside of that, the rock fails. Okay. Again, this is looking right down the axis. So this is a, a good model. Uh, it's a particularly good model for kind of, you know, unconsolidated sands and other things. Uh, works pretty well. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. The pi plane, you know, if you look at the axis here, let's see if I can draw it. If you go back to the other one, it had... Uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. Then you have a, a line called the hydrostat. This is the line sigma 1 equals to sigma 2 equals to sigma 3. So this is called the hydrostat. Okay. Well, that line is right there. So this is what you'd see if you're standing on that line looking into the yield surface. You'd see this hexahedron thing. So this is the more, more Coulomb or uh, more failure model. And next time, you know, like I said, if you go back to look at these, um, let's see, where is it at? 
go back and look at some real data, the more Coulomb model is not the best fit, obviously, for all the range of principal stress differences for this sandstone. So next time, we'll look at some more complicated models. Right? So do you guys ever heard the expression, uh, all models are wrong, some are useful? Right? So keep that in mind as an engineer. Right? We, you know, these models, they, they didn't come down on a tablet from God. Right? We, we made them up. And sometimes they're useful. So if you're dealing with a scenario in this region, your linearized Mohr envelope would probably be a useful model. If you're dealing out here, probably not. And so we'll look at some other ones, right? And of course, the better the models that better fit wider ranges of data also have more complexity. And what that more complexity means is, you know, in in a solution process, it it means that we have to move from being able to do calculations on a piece of paper to being able to do calculations in a computer to eventually when you get so complex having to go to supercomputing, which is what I do. Anyway, that's all for today.